Hey guys, it's Tamara Rose Blodgett, and I'm still doing the ketogenic fasting. I want to get right into that and let you guys know how it's working. There's a couple things that I've noticed that have changed, and everything's positive so far, except one thing, and I believe it has nothing to do with that. But first, I just want to say that I've lost, I'm down six pounds, and the crux of the matter is, is that it seemed to me the last time I was actively doing ADF, alternate day fasting, that I could kind of go off the rails or overeat or drink or do whatever I wanted to on that feed day. And then I would go and fast and it would either maintain my weight or I'd lose a little bit. And it was super effective. And I was much lighter than I am now. I think uh, I was doing a lot of it between the poundage of 150 to 155 and I was just staying there beautifully. And the minute I could stop doing alternate day fasting, of course I gained. Um, because nobody wants to stop eating that fun way and then keep up the fasting forever. So I know that the protocol for ADF is going to be uh, rolling 36s to 40s for me. That's 36 hours to 40 hours of not eating. And then the remainder would be then an eight hour window. I'm trying to keep my window in eight hours on my feed days and then no snacking in between. And that sounds like it wouldn't be a big deal, right? But on the feed days, mentally, you're really wanting to eat. So sometimes after five hours or so, you do want to have a snack because you're thinking, well, this is my feed day. I can do anything I want. But what I've noticed is that it's very important how you handle your feed days. If you do not handle your feed, your feed days well, you will not lose the way you want to lose for the effort of, of performing the ADF. So in the past, uh, maybe it was because I was maintaining I'm not sure, but now I know that what I need to do is I need to, for example, fast from 36 to 40 hours. When I start my feed window, say 10 o'clock in the morning, Hubs makes his breakfast or I make breakfast or whatever, um, then I go until six and I don't eat anything else until, you know, my last bite is before six. My first bite is after 10. And then I have eight hours in between the two meals and that gives my body enough nutrient dense foods and enough calories. You guys know how I feel about calories. They don't matter um, for my body to feel satiated sufficiently to go into the next fast and not revolt and be super hungry the whole time during my, my fasting window. Okay. Those things are said. That's the first thing. When you feed, make it an eight hour window. If you're doing these extended fasts like I am and hubs is, um, eat in the eight hour window. Don't snack between have two meals. First takeaway. Second takeaway is eat extremely low carb. Okay, what I've noticed is that if I just stick to the BBBE, beef, bacon, butter, and eggs, if I stick to that, I can guarantee a weight loss of between one and 1 1.6 pounds per fast. And that's significant because I'm within 15 or 20 pounds of a nice fighting weight for myself. I consider 150 to be pretty good. Uh, I would like to be a little lower, but mainly for cushion, not because I think the five pounds to 145 or whatever is going to actually matter. It's because it allows me to do, uh, you know, a cheat meal per se once in a while, and and that works out great. So one one to 1.6 pounds is can be yours, if if you keep to the feed window of two meals, zero carbohydrate or extremely low carbohydrate, and not, don't snack in between. That's been very good for me. Two things are a benefit of that. One, I'm very hungry for the second meal. That's nice. I don't want to eat when I'm kind of hungry. Uh, also, if you if you eat those foods, it's almost impossible to go past that stopping point when your body says, ooh, wow, mm, I'm done. Now, another thing I noticed, I did this with the, the low carb pizza. I had the same meals with a fast sandwiched in between them. I had five plain eggs for one meal, and then I had two pieces, scrambled eggs, and then I had two pieces of low carb pizza the first day, and I had it in this order. I had the eggs first at around 10, then I had the low carb pizza, two slices at five, and I actually put on 0.2 even though I had a fast the next day. And it was very disappointing to me because I was like, I felt like I didn't have a lot of food. But the low carb pizza slices, guys, are probably 650, calories per. I mean, they're super filling. They have a cheese-based crust. They have cheese on them. There's a little bit of tomato sauce, which as you guys know is a nightshade, not real great for me. Um, they had three or four different kinds of meats. I mean, they were this thick. They were more like pizza pies 
or casseroles. I mean, they were just, they were stupendous. Anyway, that was great. And so I thought to myself, okay, um, I don't like losing 0.2, gaining 0.2 after a 36 hour uh, fast. I wanna get something from that because it's work, it's discipline. And, and so the next time, so I had that grouping of food and then I had the fast. And then the next day we reversed the order of eating. We put the pizza first as breaking our fast, then the eggs at about four in the afternoon, exact same foods. I lost one and a half pounds that time because I fasted the next day and then I went into the next feed day. So that told me the order matters. If you're gonna have the heavier item, the steak, the low carb pizza, the pork, whatever it is, the pork belly, whatever you have decided on eating and it's the heavier part of the two meals, boy, have it in the morning, okay? Have it in the morning, because then you go the whole day, you get more time to digest that carbier, heavier, however you want to quantify that food. And it did make a difference. First day I lost 0.2, the second fast I lost one and a half pounds, okay? And I ended with the lighter weight food. I had like, I think four or five scrambled eggs at about four o'clock in the afternoon. And I was a little hungrier the next day, but I'll talk about that in a second. It wasn't enough for me not to be thrilled over the loss. So again, takeaway, I'm recapping again. Feed days, zero or very low carb meals. Two meals, okay? No snacking in between. Make your heavier meal the first one. And then when the second meal comes, you're hungry for it, but not as much. And that's another thing I found is that when I had the eggs, I was real hungry for the pizza on the second meal because the eggs didn't hold me like a heavier meal that would be meat centric would. And so on the second time that I did that, I went ahead and I had the pizza and I was just starting to get hungry around four. So it held me off for hours, like seven hours or seven and a half hours. And I wasn't ravenous, I was just ready to eat again. And so when I went to eat the eggs, I just finished them naturally and it was nice. I think I had a couple pats of butter and forked that in too for some extra fats. Um, I'm not uh, forcing myself to have a lot of fats because what happens is in the morning, I have three tablespoons of butter in each cup of coffee and I usually have two cups of coffee. So that's part of my food load, but it doesn't raise insulin. So I have that every day. On my fat fasting days, which is the 36 to 40 hour window when I have no food, I still incorporate butter into the two cups of coffee. And I know it's not raising my insulin and I've lost weight seamlessly with it. So if there's naysayers out there that go, oh, you have to clean fast, I'm here to tell you, you don't. You can keep your fats up a little bit and, and get something from that, some nutrients for your body, but you don't have to raise your insulin or, or experience more hunger and, and it makes the coffee taste better. I do a butter chino, guys. I put the, the tablespoons in there, the three tablespoons with hot coffee right away. And then when it's done brewing 10 or 12 minutes later, cause I've got it on bowl, so it takes longer. I go ahead and I froth the coffee up with my little frother, okay? And then I just pour in the rest of the coffee and I got a lot of nice butter foam on the top. And it's a little bit of an acquired taste in that you have to like fats and probably be a fat adapted to just taste that butter in there and go, yeah, that's great. That makes sense. My body always likes it. I don't go much past two cups though, because one, I don't want to. Uh, two, I can see myself giving up coffee eventually or just getting down to one cup. Uh, three, it makes my stomach kind of upset, especially on a, a fasting day. My stomach is like, hey, I had enough of the coffee, even with the butter in it, I'm done now. So that shows you that, you know, maybe coffee's not the best thing for you. I know they say it's got antioxidants and everything, but it probably has anti-nutrients as well. And there's some disturbing things out about coffee, like molds and and pesticides and things like that. So I'm not feeling like coffee's the do-all end all. But right now, for where I'm at on my journey, I still feel like I need the coffee to be as disciplined as what I'm doing right now. So I, I wanted to just address that. So two meals on the food feed days, zero or very low carb, and no snacking in between the two meals. Have butter in your coffee if you can tolerate it um, in the mornings, every morning, and just start the day off right with fats. And nobody says you have to have breakfast either. I'm not one of those that has an early breakfast anymore because I'm no longer ravenous for breakfast. Uh, I got through the whole night fasting, my body's fat adapted, and so it's using ketones if it needs anything. I really like that. 
And my third, my third takeaway um, has nothing to do with the fasting protocol as much, but if you'll note, let me see if you can see. <laughs> Takes guts to get this close to the camera. But my skin is vastly improved, okay? Vastly improved. And what I mean by that is that I, well, okay, for starters, guys, I just go for it. I jump in the deep end of the pool. I have a 15 times magnification mirror um, affixed to my medicine cabinet mirror. And every day I go in there and I look at my eyes and I see how they're doing because I've had a lot of rosacea uh, type of infection stuff in my eye, especially this one. And I want to see how they're doing. And then I, I want to see how the topography of my skin is doing. Is it rough? Does it look chaffed? Uh, does it have little tiny pimples on it? Uh, are there these big scaly things coming off that are rough on my face, like scaly dry skin? And there is all of that, but it's so much less now. Well, what was it before I started fasting? It was kind of bad to average, average for the last year, two years or so. I think it was October of 21, all this business started with my face. And now, of course, we're into April of 24. So I've been living with it for two and a half years. I think menopause triggered the skin things. And then it was up to me then to try to modify my hormones so that my skin could calm down. It's not an immediate process. And I've been very laissez-faire with putting in the correct protocols that I know to be the ones that are there. Okay, the interesting thing is, is that when I began fasting, I thought I could do that thing where I ate kind of a little bit edgy, you know, with the plant kingdom around the edges. And then I would like fast and go into the next fast. And I just lost uh, two pounds, I think in March is all I took off. It just wasn't effective. And I think I could have gone on like that for a year and I would have just kept losing the two pounds every month. But fasting is a discipline and it's difficult. And I see a, a light at the end of the tunnel. I'm like, okay, when I get down to my goal weight, I would, I'm still gonna fast. I'm gonna fast at least one of these 36 to 40s a week. But here's what else I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be very careful with what I eat on the feed days. I'm gonna eat when I'm hungry. And I don't mean kinda hungry, I mean good hunger. Not a little pain, but where I'm like distracted a little bit. Oh, I'm hungry, I can actually have an appetite now. Like right now I have an appetite, it's about one. That's my natural appetite. Like I had my butter and my coffee this morning, two cups of it, and, and now I'm ready to have a meal. It's a fasting day, but Hubs and I have decided because of our social life, it would be better to do an OMAD today. And we're gonna have some scraps. We have a couple of leftover steaks. We have some brisket that's left over. We have a whole pile of eggs. We're just gonna have a normal meal today. Then we're gonna go into a rolling 36 to 40, okay? Because I have plans to meet my, my girlfriend, C at uh, Casa Mayora on Friday because she's getting ready to leave Mazatlan for, I don't know, she's kind of an itinerary. It just goes on forever. It's like, I have no idea. Four months of craziness. So she's leaving the 15th. I want to grab some time before she went. I just love her. She's wonderful. She's an authentic gal and she needs to put on weight. I can give her some of mine. Hmm. Anyway, that doesn't work no matter how much you wish it. <laughs> so we're, we're going to be doing that. And I, I feel like when I do get down to my normal weight, which I, like I said, I consider to be about 150, I'm five foot 10. And I wear about a size eight very comfortably there and some sixes. And so I'm on the small side. I don't have a big frame. Uh, I don't have big bones and I'm, I'm kind of spindly and leanly constructed. And so extra weight on me makes it just makes me look bigger. I don't hold it well. Um, my mother-in-law does, my husband does, they have more of that metamorph or whatever it's called build and they can work with that. I do not have that advantage. I have height, but you know, again, I don't want to look like the big farm girl where the, the hay bale is going to get chucked. I don't want that look. I want the, the lean, delicately constructed look. I think that's more feminine and pretty and that's what I'm going for, but I'm not going to, you know, and that's what I was in high school guys. When I was a young woman, you know, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, before I started having children, I maintained a weight between 145 and 150 effortlessly. I didn't do anything. I just ate when I was hungry and, and I didn't overeat or anything. I got into kind of a pattern of overeating as I got older and I don't know what that is, but I'm, I'm going to try to rein that back a little bit and just kind of finish my meal before I'm full. 
uh, type of mentality. And I think it'll be easier for me then once I be have, that becomes a habit. And I'm not ashamed to admit that. I mean, it's just kind of what happens. You know, you, you get surplus income. Now that your children are raised, you start getting more relaxed about your habits. You start kind of enjoying life without being fettered and burdened by these huge things that were part of your youth that kind of kept you thinner to some degree because you just simply didn't have the time to consider anything else. At least in my my book, I didn't, and I know Hubs is too. So uh, that's probably what my protocol is going to be. Um, on my feed days, I will I'll choose my fasting day. The one day a week is what I assume it'll be. And I might have to throw an OMAD in there too, one meal a day. Say I have no social events planned on Wednesday. I'm not going to be doing anything but hanging around the house. That'll be a fasting day. And I'll do extra work. I'll do things that need to be done that I find boring usually that don't fit in easily. And I'll go ahead and get them finished that day and make myself busy while I'm fasting. And it'll be fine. And then if I find that my weight's creeping up a little bit, I'll throw an OMAD in there. And that'll be a clean eating OMAD too, where I just eat a regular meal and call it quits. I don't worry about it. And usually a regular meal for me runs around 2,000 calories. Um, and I say calories because it's easily identifiable. Everyone has that point of reference. They kind of know what 2,000 calories is. So that's why I keep mentioning calories, only so that it's instantly understood. But I, I've, I've lost weight. I mean, when I do these rolling fasts or even on OMAD, I can have up to 2,500 calories if it's the right kind of food and not suffer anything, any ill will. I keep dairy out of the program and I do the beef, butter, bacon, and eggs. I almost cannot gain weight on that. And I'll tell you why. This is another thing. Super important. Um, when you're eating nutrient-dense food, species-specific food, like those four things that, that aforementioned, you will not gain weight, and I'll tell you why, is because what happens is we have satiety hormones, and they're in place to tell us, oh, stop eating. It's an intuitive, physiological, innate system in place. Yesterday, when I had my steak that Hubs made at 10, he made a couple of really thin steaks, because we were just kind of using up everything, right, that we had that was in loose packages and stuff. And then he made our regular 12 ounce steaks. And so I had the thin steak first and it was about four or five ounces, I think. And then I went to dig into the 12 ounce one. I got about halfway done and that's all I could do. So I had six plus maybe five, 11 ounces. I'm only good for about three quarters of a pound or so. And then suddenly what happened is that I just was like, oh, I can't have one more bite. It was so obvious to me, I laughed out loud. I was like, such a clear signal from my body. Of course, it was ribeye. And ribeye's got a great proportion of fat and protein in tandem. And when you have that species-specific, nutrient-dense food, your body's able to fully encapsulate its needs. And so when you got, got to satiety and your body has enough nutrients for that go, it says, hey, we're done. We don't need any more. And I mean it, it's strong. So for those of you that are fat adapted or trying to understand fullness, because I think that is like the worst, most complicated thing that should not be, that has been a challenge for me from the beginning. And I'm not the only one. Everybody says, oh, eat to appetite. Well, that's vague. Eat until you have the satiety. Insert that reaction, okay? That's the one you need to look for. And it's extremely clear. If you want to lose weight, you got to want it bad, guys. But look at what's happening to me. I'm sleeping better and everything. It's nice. Now, I will say since I started fasting, it changed my digestions my, and my regularity. Of course it would, wouldn't it? So I, I want to just delve into that very quickly and then, we'll, and then I'll let you go. <laughs> so you guys know that in September I started taking MAG-C, magnesium citrate, and vitamin D3 in tandem, and I started being regular for the first time in my adult life four days later, and it never stopped. I just kept up those amounts, and it was done. 
I got my vitamin D tested, I'm dead center now, instead of being super deficient, which I was before. So that's lovely. I don't feel any different for that, but I'm sure it's made a difference in my system. It just has to, you know, duh. Anyway, vitamin D is critical for thyroid and everything else. So I did that, I did that, and did that, ran out of my Mag-C pills. Couldn't get the same brand delivered down here to Muslim Lawn. So I chose another one very carefully, hoping for the best. It was 100 milligrams less per tablet, so I started instantly taking three, which put me at 1,200 versus the 1,000 I had been taking every day. I thought it was close enough. Well, um, I think it's got me sleeping a little bit better. And I think the reason is because I'm having 200 milligrams more per day. However, my digestion has way slowed down and not doing as well. So this particular brand is not as good as the one by Nobi Nutrition that I've been taking. And I, the instant I go back to the States, I will start taking the old brand again. Having said that, I was taking the old brand at the same time that I was taking the, the Lugol's iodine liquid supplement with the drop. I'm up to seven drops per eight ounce cup now of the Lagols, and I do that every day too. And before my digestion was, TMI guys, kind of loose and not perfect, but I was going and I knew that was better than not going for all the days I would not go before. So it was an improvement, but it bothered me. I was like, I know that this isn't as good as it could be. I should be more solid than this. I started taking the iodine and lo and behold, I started having blue ribbon poops period. So for a month I experienced that. So I was like, okay, magnesium citrate, vitamin D3, and the goals. And suddenly I have the best poop ever known to God. Okay. And that was the first time too. So I didn't have as much reactive stuff. I had better quality poop. And I know you guys, but you have to go through your whole adult life being traumatized by always having to think about it, never being able to go and to, to release myself from having to ever think about it again was a freedom I had never experienced. And it's a bodily thing, you need to. So it's like you can't have the quality of life you should if you're having all this trouble. So uh, that was very cool. So the only little hiccup right now is that with ADF, my digestion slowed, which didn't matter when I was doing the old magnesium citrate and I found that great benefit with taking the iodine too, which obviously these minerals and vitamins work together. They're not separate. You can't just take, for instance, a vitamin C tablet and go, I'm good. You actually need some of these critical elements and minerals and vitamins together because they work with one another. They work for your system as a whole. And I didn't know that, and now I do. I have proof is in the pudding. Now it's anecdotal. I'm no doctor, I'm no nutritionist, as I've mentioned before, but I have a body, I'm me, and I'm trying things, and maybe you can too. And one other little caveat I'll put on the end of I apologize. Magnesium was in our water source anciently. Our bodies are evolved to need it. That and iodine, and it's no longer being found in the dirt. Our dirt is depleted, it's polluted, it's, it's compromised. And so those things are not leaching into the groundwater, which is what we use to drink from mud puddles or rivers or whatever we could find. And our bodies need that for premium thriving function. And they're not getting it now. The water's all sterilized and polluted and it no longer has those, those essential minerals and, and vitamins that we needed. They were traced, but they were there and we needed water. So we, would all, we were always having it. And it was highly absorbable because that's, there was nothing to impede that. I highly suggest getting those things. I'm gonna go ahead and link down below the magnesium and the vitamin D3 I take, although I will be looking for a better one, but this one's working, this one's working. I don't like non-gelatin and non-animal products being in my minerals, supplements, and my vitamins because I don't want soy and I don't want plant. And there is a difference. And, and then I'll put down the Lugol's I use. And I'm gonna be getting my uh, iodine test done before we leave Mazat Lawn. So I have a marker of how much iodine I have in my system and if I fall in range. That tells me if I need to cut back or add more iodine. And I'll share that with you guys so at least you know where I sit. Am I average? Am I above average? Am I below average? We'll see. Whatever the case may be, I'm doing better than I was. And it changed how my body operated. So I'm having enough for a better degree of function. And it does affect thyroid. It does affect thyroid. It's critical. Iodine's critical for thyroid. And no doctor tells you that. They don't tell you that. So you're left to guess. And I think that's, uh, 
terrible. Anyway, thank you so much for tuning in. Please like this video and subscribe. I'm growing a little bit right now. I'm getting some subscribers. I get a, you know, several every week now. I'm excited about that. Please share and I'll continue to, ch to share nutrition videos and living form videos and hair videos. And I have a frugal fashion short little video coming up. I love the unscripted life updates. I love the Variety Channel and I hope you do too. Anyway, love you guys.